send for the women. The women who will pray. The women who have talents, gifts, and resources. To do serious damage to demonic agendas. Send for the women. The women who will mourn. The women who haven't allowed bitterness and hate. To turn them into mere mannequins. The women who aren't so downtrodden. That they've forgotten how to feel. Send for the women who still have the ability to feel and cry. So they might wail against what the devil is doing. Send for the women who will weep and wail. The women who will mourn in sackcloth and ashes. Send for the women. The women who will wake up, everyone around them, calling out, The devil is destroying us. Death is on its way. Send for the women who will be God's warning shout to his people. His alarm system. His tornado signal. His air raid siren. The women who God will use to warn his people of the impending consequences of sin. Send for the women who have a God-given destiny to destroy the power of Satan over God's people by waking them up and calling them to a morning of repentance. Women who would teach their daughters to weep against sin and the assault of the devil. Send for the women. Women who have a destiny to open their mouth and cry against the evil that the devil has put upon God's people. Women who have ideas to be voiced, energy to be released, abilities to be exercised, power to be loosed, spiritual gifts to be expressed, prayers to be prayed. Send for the women who look toward the future. To what they can be. What they can do. What they can say. What they can pray. What they can possess that will bring glory to God. Defeat the devil and see a nation saved. Send for the women. Hey, if I were to ask you who you are, most of you would reply with your job title. Am I right? We often do that. That's what we're going to discuss today here on the podcast, The Busy Believer. But just before we do that, I need to tell you and give you a reminder that if you find yourself short on time for Bible reading and a study, you can sign up for our show on thebusybeliever.alitu.com. You can also find us at Amazon Podcast and Spotify Podcast. Now, let's get into it. Your identity releases your destiny. Well, hey, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Monica Hansen. So I want to get knee deep into this study today. And the title of this podcast is Identity Releases Your Destiny. And let me ask you a question. If you were to ask someone today who they are, most would reply by stating their job title, their race, or how they feel about themselves, right? You would hear, I'm a doctor, I'm an American, or the typical smart aleck answer, I'm a loser. <laughs> you know, our identity is not to be found in any of these, only in being a son or daughter of God. You know, I've heard the prophetic teacher, uh, Bobby Connor, say, you know, Heaven and hell are asking the same question. Who do you think you are? And that's even in, in Matthew chapter 16. And if we start in verse 14, we'll see Jesus asking a question to Peter. The infamous question. Who do you say I am? And let's go ahead and read starting in verse 14. And I'm reading um, actually from the NIV. And like I tell everybody else, Stick with what you read. If it's the King James Version, stick with that. Amplified, living. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. All right? So verse 14. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, I know, I can't say it all. <laughs> he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others. Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? See, Simon Peter answered, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven 
And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I'm going to stop there on verse 19. See, Peter has a revelation from God who Jesus is. The son of the living God, right? Jesus in return, he he reveals to Peter who Peter himself is called to be. As we spend time with Jesus and we dig into his word, the Holy Spirit reveals to us who he is and who we are in him. And that's like a thing that mankind doesn't even know who they are. They just tell you what they do. There is no other way to walk in our true identities as children of God in that mentality. In the world, they gain acceptance from people by the things they accomplish. And that's how their identity that's how they find their identity in what they do. This is not the way in the kingdom. See, in God's world, in his kingdom, we are accepted and loved no matter the circumstances. And from that, we earn to do good works. We are not earn, we yearn. I was trying, I was thinking of something else, but we yearn to do good works for the Lord. We want to do good. It's kind of like that kid that wants to get that reward from mom or dad. They want to do good things. See, performance-based acceptance seems to be a huge issue in society today. It always starts with those with the kids, like I was saying. And subconsciously, you know, we learn that, that people love us because of what we do. But God loves us whether we are raising the dead or taking a nap or walking on the water. So let's go to Luke. Luke chapter... Three, all right. It's a uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament, and we're going to start in verse twenty-one. And it says, "When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven: 'You are my Son, whom I love.'" With you, I am well pleased. I tried to change the voice on that one, right? All right, we're going to stop on 22. I have always been amazed by this scripture for the simple fact that Jesus, up until this point in his life of getting baptized, he performs no miracles. And if you can remember those that watch The Chosen, when Jesus um, went to the wedding, he even told his mom, my time has yet, not yet come. So he hadn't done anything to, to have that title of what we do, of who our identity is, is by what we do. That's what I'm trying to say if that comes out right. <laughs> but see, God was pleased with Jesus, not because of all the miracles, not because of what he's doing on earth, but simply because he was his son. And this is the first key in understanding our, th- our authority as believers. Jesus says to his disciples before leaving, he says in uh, John uh, 14, uh, verse, I think it's 18. And he says, here it is, I will not leave you as orphans. And see, prior to coming to the Lord, our original I guess our original state of being is like orphans. That's why in in Romans, it says the spirit of adoption causes us to cry out, Abba, Father, right? We have been adopted into the family of God by our heavenly Father, just according to, to Romans 8. And in this, become his children. The Bible also says, see, we have become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus, And that's further down in in Romans 8, um, verse 17. See, in order for us to walk in our given authority, we must have an understanding of who we are and whose we are. So many people in the body of Christ don't know who their identity is in the Lord. They just say, I'm a Christian and I'm a nurse. Or, 
I go to such and such church and I'm a home mom. That's it. But no, that's what the world and Satan wants you to believe, that you're not worth anything, that you're just a home mom or you're just a doctor or just a counselor or just a wife. But we are so much more. I mean, we say, I'm just a home mom or I'm just a vet. But God looks at you and says, oh, faithful one, oh, warrior, oh, daughter of of the most high God. He sees you totally different than how we see ourselves. And the devil is afraid of believers who know who they are in Christ. And he'll try to keep us from understanding our identity as the sons and daughters of God. See, the father affirms Jesus as his son when he got baptized. And the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We know that story, see. And here it is. It's it's interesting to see how the enemy tempts Jesus. And if we think about it, two times Satan says to Jesus, if you really are the son of God. And Satan is challenging Jesus' identity as God's son. And this is the exact same battle we are in. It's that battle of the mind. It's the, it's the battle over our, our identity. And to see if Satan can destroy who we are in Christ in our minds. Because it's a battle in the mind, right? You have to remember that. If he can destroy it in your mind of who you really are, then guess what? You will never stand up and face the devil and pull down those strongholds. You won't do it because you just think, I am just a home mom. I'm just a wife. I'm just the pastor. I'm just an evangelist. See, it doesn't matter what you do out there and how much money you make. It is knowing who you are in Christ that is the most important thing in our spiritual walk. See, in order for us to operate in the authority Christ has given us, and this is what I've been learning recently, and I asked the Lord this. I was praying about it, and as I was going through different attacks in my own family, I was like, Lord, I know how to battle rattle in the spiritual or in the physical realm, being that I'm a vet. I know how to lock and load and go to war with the military, but I need to learn how to fight spiritually. And the Lord showed me It is authority. It is knowing who you are in Christ and knowing the authority that we have in him. And in order for us to operate in that authority Christ has given us, we must understand who we are. Our faith in Jesus enables us to overcome the world, overcome the the spiritual dark realm, overcome all of the forces of evil. I mean, a six-year-old child who has faith in Jesus has more power over the devil, over the spiritual realm, than sometimes, sadly, a pastor has, because we don't realize who we are in the Lord. So here's an example, and I was thinking about this. Remember the movie, The Lion King? And there is that scene where Simba looks into his reflection in the water and he sees his father, right? You remember that part? And the monkey that's there um, says, what do you see? And then lo and behold, Simba sees his father, the king in the clouds, because the clouds opens up, right? And um, uh, King Mufasa says, you have forgotten me. And Simba says, How have I forgotten you? I mean, he was just like, that's his dad. He was close to him, right? But Mufasa says, because you have forgotten who you are. See, Simba was the son of the king, the heir to the throne. He was living a carefree life. You know, the carefree life, the Hakuna Matata, the no worry song. See, he was living that until he realized that he had a mandate to restore his father's kingdom. He just wanted to take off and do a woe is me. Um, My father died. I have nobody. He didn't even think of his mom and the rest of the pride. And see, as believers, we are kind of the same. If we wander around not knowing who we are, 
We won't ever step into our kingdom mandate of who, of who God says that we are. See, as sons and daughters of the king, we are called to manifest his kingdom with signs and wonders and miracles. Now, if we go back to even when we think about when Jesus was in the wilderness and after Jesus overcomes Satan in the wilderness, um, we read later on in Luke uh, chapter four, um, verse 14, and it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Doesn't sound like somebody that doesn't know who they are in Christ, does it? Or who who he was in God, not in Christ, because he was Christ. Jesus returned from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, and in those signs, wonders, and miracles followed his ministry. See, as believers, we have seasons, those time frames, that feel like we are in the wilderness. Those are the seasons where the enemy challenges our identity the most or when we're going through those battles in our life, whether it's through family, friends, marriage, work, finances, it doesn't matter. But as we stand on the word of God, that we are God's beloved children and whom he is well pleased, our ministries, our callings, they're solidified from that place on. See, there's nothing we can do to gain God's love and acceptance. There's nothing we can do or become, right? It comes simply because while we were yet sinners, Christ died on the cross for us. And that is in Romans chapter 5. Value is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for something oftentimes out there in, in everyday world. It's, well, how much will you give me for that? Or how much are you, how much you going to give? How much do you want? But see, Jesus purchased us with his own blood. David said, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificent magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all nations. And David goes on to say, therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made an extensive preparation before his death. And you can read all of that. And I know I forgot to bring it up to you guys because I had it written down here in my notes. And that's in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 5. And then it goes on further. If you scroll down to verse 14, it says, I have taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord. A hundred thousand talents of gold a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed, and wood and stone. And you may add to them. You have many workmen, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, as well as men skilled in every kind of work in gold, silver, bronze, and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. This is what David said now. He gave him everything, right? And so I began to study and look up through all of the different versions of the Bibles that I do have at home. I was like, well, okay, what's 100,000 talents of gold? What's all this silver? What is all this? And this is what I found out. Goodness, David put away so much for his son to build the temple. So here, let's break it down. This is the cost of building this temple. That 100,000 talents of gold that he said, today it is equivalent to about 4,000 tons of gold. Tons of gold. 100, what is it? 1 million talents of silver. I don't know why I said 1,000. 1 million talents of silver are equal today to about 40,000 tons of silver. So which this totals, if you add it all up, right, this comes to about 41,250 tons of all of these metals put together, the gold and the silver. And then you have all of what he gave them in the bronze and iron. 
And the bronze and iron were so great, I couldn't even get it, grasp everything that that was just there. And then on top of that, then we got to add all the wood and all the stone that they used for it. But oh my gosh, 41,000 today is probably a little bit more because I, as I was looking at that and, and the word and the value of gold and silver now, it could be more. It could be about 45,000 tons. But see, and here's what I want to end with. The, the best thing about all of this is, see, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what the Lord tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And I know I'm going, going over my time frame already, but I'm going to look it up for you guys real quick. Matter of fact, I'm not going to grab my Bible. I'm going to look it up um, on the Bible app because it's closer. And it's um, 1 Corinthians, like I said, 6, verse 19. And it says, this was the only one I didn't have written down. Um, it says, and right now I have it on the New King James Version. So, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own for you were bought at a price. Therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And I added verse 20 to that. So see, the dwelling place of God is us. Jesus paid a greater price for us than David ever paid for Solomon's temple. For all of those silver, all of the gold, all of the bronze, the iron, all of the wood and the stone. And we think the tons of that, 42,000 tons of all of that, is nothing compared to what Jesus paid for us. So if you ever feel like you have no value and you don't feel worthy, just remember the price Jesus paid for you. And with that, have a blessed week. I hope it blessed you as much as it did for me. And with that, peace out. Well, hey, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast, The Busy Believer. And if you like the episode or think it will be useful for someone else, hey, please give us a review over at podchaser.com forward slash busy believer. And if you have any questions, you can jump on over to Truth Social and follow me at The Busy Believer. And remember, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Isaiah 43.1. Have a blessed day.